Hey, hunting family, you are tuning into the Tracks and Tackle podcast, brought to you by Menser Outdoors. Hey there, hunting family. This week on Tracks and Tackle, we are thrilled to bring on a special guest who's no stranger to outdoors and the world of podcasting. Mike Beecham, host of Mountain and Marsh Podcast, will be joining us this week. Mike wears many hats. He's the owner of two successful small businesses, Junk Clear and Sail Ready Solutions. But beyond the hustle, Mike is deeply passionate about the outdoors, a passion that resonates with everything we stand for at Tracks and Tackle. Mike comes highly recommended from our friends over at the 3B Outdoors Club. And let me tell you, that recommendation didn't disappoint. Mike is a tremendous source of input for guidance for the Tracks and Tackle team when we were just getting started. And it's an absolute pleasure to have him on the show today with us. We're going to go deep diving into some great conversations about hunting, podcasting, everything in between. So sit back, relax, and join us as we connect with Mike Beecham, true outdoorsman, a fantastic contributor to the community and the newest member of our hunting family. Hey there, hunting family. It's time to give a shout out to a company that's been keeping our communities moving since 1995. I'm talking about Interstate Garage Doors. For nearly three decades, Interstate Garage Doors has been the go-to choice for comprehensive garage door services in South Central PA, as well as the surrounding Hagerstown, Maryland and Martinsburg, West Virginia areas. And get this, they're not just any company, they're veteran owned and family operated with a proud history of serving both residential and commercial clients. Their professional technicians are the real deal, offering top notch installations from industry leading manufacturers and expert repairs for all garage door makes and models. From residential garage doors to overhead doors and openers, Interstate Garage Doors does it all. So whether you're a hardworking contractor building homes or a homeowner looking for service or just needing an upgrade, you can trust Interstate Garage Doors to get the job done right. And hey, they're not just experts in garage doors, they're also experts in giving back to the community, sponsoring podcasts like Tracks and Tackle. Are you ready to experience the interstate difference for yourself? If so, here's a little something extra for our loyal podcast listeners. Use promo code Tracks and Tackle when you contact Interstate so they know you heard about them here. Just visit IGDoors.com today to get an estimate or request service or give them a call at 717-263-3150. Don't wait. Take the first step towards a smoother, more secure garage today. I set all this stuff up, but you know, people, people don't realize how much work goes into this. So yeah, my thing is, uh, yeah, just double committing myself and then being like, oh crap. Like I forgot, I promised you know, Ronnie I'd be here or I forgot like, ah, oh, like, you know, especially, yeah. especially the girlfriend, I make plans and I got to bail on her. I was like, the it, biggest it thing. gets me in trouble. So I was just like, ah, like I need to be better and, and yeah, it's much easier to plan something way in advance and then you can stay true to it. That, so that's it. That's it. I, I try to, that's why I live by the calendar now because it's not just clients. It's not just you guys like coming to a recording. It's not, even if my wife is like, we're going to dinner or I'm going out to dinner with my friend this night. Like I have to know. Cause if she spooks me with that two yeah. hours prior, I'm like, actually I just accepted a job in wherever. And I got to go look at this job. And then, you know, it's always something, but. All right. All right. Well, listen, this is good. You can see how we we sort of fly by the seat of our pants here. Let me get an SD card in this. That would help you. Just measure measure twice, cut once. All right. All right. That's, that's ready to rock. I am. Uh, I just got us. We're, we're, we're rolling. 
Um, but we can talk about whatever, man. I like depending on the guests that I have on. Sometimes I'll like draw up an agenda of talking points for an interview yeah. and, and stuff like that. But I didn't do that. I figure we can just sort of get to know each other a little bit because mm-hmm. we come through the mutual con- uh, contact of uh, of Chris. I, I feel that um, probably a lot of people would know if anybody listening to this would know me. It'd be Mountain and Marsh. Um, but also sale ready solutions. Uh, I'm in the area, junk clear. We own that as well. Um, so that's kind of how a lot of people that locally know of me, uh, Mountain and Marsh kind of being my pet project that started five years ago. And it went from clothing to uh, videography to, and then it just boiled down to, I thought doing a podcast was fun. I could do it from my home. People would call me if they wanted. I built a decked out studio, and then that that was it. I guess yeah. kind of. Well, I want, I want, I really want to know the story um, for me because everybody has that why. And right. whenever we first started podcasting, right, Chris had told me about your podcast. So I checked you out, and I actually reached out to you, and yeah. you gave me like some pointers. And one of the first things you asked, are you trying to make money doing this, or are you trying to just do it for fun? You know, something to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like for us. We're, we're just have fun. Like when it becomes work, then I'll probably stop doing it, you know? And as far as like a timeline goes, like sometimes we post every week and we record every week. We try to record like, like top heavy and get front load. Yeah. And just yeah, get some scheduled out, do but it doesn't that. always happen that way. No. And so, no. um, basically if I can get three episodes a month out, I'm, I'm happy as can be. Yeah. I think that, uh, like from the beginning, So it was me and four other guys total, three other guys, and we did a whole lot of hunting, but a lot of duck hunting. I've spent years and years in the Chesapeake Bay duck hunting, and um, we would be out in the blind, and my buddy would be like, hey, man, before this is before he settled down, and he he works, I think he's still working at the Pentagon right now, but so before he settled down and everything got itself figured out in his life, he he was ambitious. He loved the outdoors. Uh, we loved the, the shore, Chesapeake Bay. We utilized it a lot. And he's like, man, we ought to do something. And I'm like, well, what can we do? And so we all kind of sat down, figured out which way we were going to go. And part of figuring that out was um, I would I threw out, like, how about a podcast and we'll do some video stuff. And he wanted to do a clothing thing, uh, kind of like a – salt like type yeah, yeah, thing, you know? apparel. And I'm like, there's a million of those. Like, but it's also a million podcasts. He wanted to make money. Me, yeah, that was a great end goal, but I cared more about I had great ideas for inventions for sure. in the outdoors. And every time I'm sitting in a tree stand, I'm like, oh, I could really use this. I know. But I still have some killer ones that actually would probably be great. With. So I I'm we kind of separated because I was like, you know, I want to just have fun. I, I made I made very good money at that point, and I continued to grow. I used to work in D.C. and Baltimore and construction management and stuff. And so I made good money. I didn't need and – I, and I love the outdoors because it is my release. I don't want right. to be stressed because of the outdoors in any way. So I started the podcast, met awesome people, got to hunt with awesome people, Um got great products, got some for free because of me advertising for them, doing podcasts. But really it's like, it's just become something that I only want to do if it's still fun for me, just like you said. And yeah, when it becomes so, like work, like why bother? Yeah. My social media people ask me now, like you never post, you used to post like two, three times a week. Sorry, but like our businesses are making me a lot of money and I am not going to stop worrying right, about that. Yeah. Yeah. My kids don't eat uh, likes on Instagram. So that doesn't matter like to that. me. Like, yeah. And so it's for, for me that that's where I'm at. I, that's what I enjoyed the most about it. And uh, just getting to learn and know new people has been really cool. Yeah. I mean, for us, like that's, that's the deal. Like we're, we're, we've been at it for about a year. Um we're still trying to figure out the quality and, you know, put out a better product. You know, certainly the first, first video I ever made was, you know, trash and um, started filming hunts just on a whim um, because I had a, I had a small buck coming into me and 
I had a cell phone that I had a camera, you know, and didn't have that growing up, you know, camera on my, so yeah. I was just going to watch it come in and uh, get it on film and, uh, turned out it was, uh, it was large enough to take. It had the, it met antler restrictions. And so I had the choice. Do I just film this thing or do I, you know, slide the camera in my shirt pocket and try to get my bow off the hook and uh, so that's what I did, you know, I, and I got the shot off and I, and I harvested the deer. It wasn't a big deer. It was no trophy, obviously. But to me, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was hunting meat and I took that deer. So then I filmed the recovery and I thought to myself, this isn't, this isn't half bad, you know, trying to like put together. I had the approach. I had the only thing I didn't have was the kill shot. And so then that like that started my my slight obsession with like gearing up and getting, you know, so then we invested in some tacticams and, you know, got got some arms and, and things that I can put my camera, my even using my cell phone. And, you know, we purchased a couple of cameras and self started to self film our hunts, but it's hard to self film. You know, sometimes you get the film, sometimes you don't. You got to decide whether you're hunting for meat or whether you're out there to get content. Yeah. And so sometimes, like last year, um, I went out on opening day rifle and I'd hunted really hard. We hunted really, really hard all archery season long. And I didn't even take the Tacticam out with me. And so, you know, I had an opportunity at a really nice, really nice deer. And, um, I harvested the deer, but I did not get any of it on, you know, yeah. maybe one of the biggest deer I shot in my life, but I didn't get it on film. So that's how it started. And um, I was sitting, I was sitting at my pool last year, two years ago. And I was just sitting down there thinking about, yeah, man, we really ought to start documenting what we're doing. We're, we're posting pictures or short videos of what we're doing on just a, a regular outdoor page. But thought, man, if we started podcasting, we can start talking with other guys yeah. and, and networking. And that brings me back to what you had said um, about the networking, because we're meeting all sorts of cool people doing this. And I think your your Rolodex just continues to grow the longer that you do it. Yeah, we we got to not only hunt. I say we. It ended up just being me. After probably six months to a year, you're the long suffering one. Yeah, well, I'm the one who spent the thousands of dollars on right. gear, um, building a studio, the entire thing. But the and I, uh, it's okay. Uh, it's my all my work office now, so it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's set up as a studio and all, but like I'm going to spend all that money. And I spent all the time learning how to do it, and we've done video out of the podcast, and we've like I call people call into me, and I spend all this time scheduling. People don't realize how much editing, like people don't realize how much time it takes. A ton of time. And so when people are like, "Hey, sorry, can we just reschedule?" I'm just like. Actually, no, don't worry about it, man. I already got somebody for next week. And it's so hard. I know that everybody has a life, but it's it's very hard. You, you know, got to treat it like a business to some degree. Yeah. There's yeah. a level of professionalism. And the pe- people don't know, but it ended up just being me, really. And um, and I've gotten to go on. I went out to the Monongahela last, but two years ago in duck season right below Pittsburgh. Uh, went out there and did some duck hunting in the mountains and stuff. And just – you get to meet all these cool people that do cool stuff. And the every, mostly everybody's cool. Everybody's like, Hey, I just do this for fun too. You want to come out and hunt? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Stay yeah. in my spare bedroom. <laughs> cool. And then I, you know, I do stuff like that. We're so, all cut from the same cloth to some degree. I think, um, even though we all have different upbringings and different backgrounds, um, yeah. the passion is the, the common thread, I think. Yeah. I, I, I think that pa- Pennsylvania is, um, Harbors a lot of outdoors. I mean, I, I mean it, to me, it seems like there's more hunters here than anywhere. Like I grew up in Maryland. Um, I'm not, I'm not just saying that because of public land. It was a, it was a shock for me to come to like Miss show where they put roads and trails every half mile. Right. And I'm walking in from one side, like, Oh yeah, nice and thick. And there's another road. You think and you're in the deep woods and then like, you hit what? a logging road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, so yeah, that's all very odd to me, but. Um, yeah, pa- Pennsylvania harbors quality hunters and outdoorsmen for the most part. Um, and, and I really enjoy the fact that PA spends as much money as they do on public lands and upkeep. Yeah. Because Maryland, you got the Chesapeake Bay that they spend all this money on 
So the rest of the public land's like, eh. Yeah, you get inland and it's uh, it's not the same story as the, uh, yeah. the watershed area. Mm-hmm. So would you say for public land there isn't as much in Maryland compared to PA? Yeah, for sure. Um, unless you, well, let me rephrase that. From Western Maryland, what little bit of land that, that is Western Maryland, I hunted, I turkey hunted an area last year that was like a couple miles from the PA line and only like 25 miles or 20 miles from West Virginia. Like you're, you're not far at all between the two states. There's a lot of public land out there. When you get to the Eastern shore, the tracks of public land are just old farms. So they could be anywhere from 80 acres to 300 acres and that's it. And you'll have 20 guys trying to pack in in turkey season on 300 acres because that's all that's all there they're, is. They're only picking. They're picking the only spots they have to hunt, really, unless they want to travel all the way out to Western Maryland or buy another license. Um, so that's, you know, Maryland's pretty hard. Chesapeake Bay is awesome. Let's be honest, but it's like hunting lands. Like, oh, great! Like, there's not much hunting. Land. Yeah. So I, I see you do like posting a lot of like bow fishing. You're out on the water. I know yeah. you, through, um, you know the. Uh, the rumor mill, you're, you're a duck nut, you know, that sort of stuff, which, um, you know, if you get into that, I can see how that's a, that's an enjoyable mm-hmm. thing. Um, have you ever done like upstate, like upstate Pennsylvania? Uh, it, I guess New York's kind of like that too, when you get, you know, away from the cities and stuff, but like big woods upstate New uh, PA. So my family, since 1952, my family's hunted the same mountain in virginia um and it's on public land it's Mm -hmm. big it's george washington national forest it's one of the largest tracks of steady tracks of public land uh, up and down the east coast and it's millions of acres and we hunt that national forest every year for the old guys go down for an entire month of november um we go i go down for 10 days Sometimes early muzzleloader, and then also we go um, turkey season for like three, four, five days dependent. I grew up doing that. I've hunted big, big tracks of woods with roads eight, 10 miles, 12 miles away. That's how I know the mountain, and that's what I love. Right. I love that type. Of, I love big Appalachian mountains. So I know where you're. Ta- I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, when I go to like Michelle, it's like this isn't it. Like, this isn't what it's I love. Still too populated. I like being able to just go and three miles in, not see anybody, and set up on a scrape all day and eat a bologna sandwich. Like that's all. <laughs> I don't really care. Like that's what I want to do. You know what I mean? Like when I was at Michelle for the first time, I'm like, this is Pennsylvania. Like. <laughs> There's roads. There's a guy on a four hundred road past me. What's going on? So there's a lot of uh, I want to say road hunters, but, <laughs> but people we'll just, just look we'll just down say, the barrel lines. Yeah, we're, we're, we're just we'll just say there's, there's scout. There's a lot of scouting goes on from the uh, behind the windshield. So we'll just uh, say that this neck of a show. I've done a lot of uh, scouting. I'd say and shed hunting this uh, this spring, and I just get the dog out training yeah but uh i'd be walking yeah. steep parts yeah. of uh the mountain and i'm like man like no man has ever traveled here before and i look down there's like empty beer bottles and you see that orange taper you know somebody tapes in the tree so you see a tree stand but yeah tree stands are we're everywhere i think in the little strip uh woods up there is like 10 to 20 tree stands like i'm on x and i'm trying mm-hmm. to just pattern to know my way around the woods but yeah there's there's hunters out there there's a lot of them I, I've always, in Michelle, I've, I always found it funny that you could drive down the road and you can almost count in your head 10 seconds and turn your head and find another arms track, like a, yeah. a ribbon or like one of those, uh, those night yeah. eyes. Yeah. I'm like, in where I hunt in Virginia, that is nil. There is, and, and it's, it's illegal to leave stuff out, but also like, it's so big that if you drive up the road, yeah, you might pass a couple trucks off hunting. Those guys are more than likely local, and they're just going in half a mile. I get to walk, like, as far as I my body will let me walk, and then walk down the mountain this way or down the mountain that way. And, like, we, I can hunt wherever I want. And uh, so, yeah, it's, Michelle's a, a weird one to me. When I first got in there, I was like, 
everything's clear cut. They, you know, and then I drive around the corner and there's a dozer sitting. I'm like, they won't yeah. stop clear cutting this place. This yeah. is wild. There's there are a lot of quarries around here too because the most of them most of the hill is sand, you know. Yeah. So they they dig it out. And they they put it to work. Yeah. So I mean, as far as where we do we do a lot of our hunting in Western PA, mm -hmm. and so it's it's anything but flat. I lo I like it up there, you know. And there there are some nice there's nice genetics, you know, in the whitetails out there. Um, but you gotta sort of like you said, you got to travel to get to the spot where there's mm -hmm. because it's still populated. And that's the thing with like South Pennsylvania, South Central Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. Um it's just it's too developed and too populated. But once you get up, you know, northern northern PA, northwestern PA, even northeastern, I guess, um, you got a lot less population and those those state forests are are really They're wide vast, open. You know? Yeah. And I one thing that it bugs the heck out of me. I've talked about on the podcast before, and I don't know if you guys saw the buck I killed last year with my bow, but that was at my house in Gettysburg, um, and I own four acres. I have about two and a half acres of woods, it's enough to, to hunt. And the, when uh, a buddy of mine found out that I was moving to Pennsylvania, he said, oh, there's no big deer in Pennsylvania, and I'm like, there's big deer actually everywhere. Like, uh <laughs> They they just have to get old enough to get big. You gotta let them go. And so what what you're getting at is correct. There's too many people in South Central Pennsylvania to where because it's a lot of overdevelopment and just tracts of farmland and small parcels of public land, the deer get eaten up because the hunters are always in there. They're always stressing them. They're always putting pressure on them. I killed a four and a half year old. 10 point last year, you know, off the ground with my bow at my own house. Um, that is, is beautiful. Uh, he's probably 125, 130 with deductions. And there was a bigger buck running with him. And every year, because I live within battlefield, right? There are these bucks that are, that do get that old. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes they, sense. I see them and I, and I know that there are these big mature they're not just mature deer they're big mature white tails in my area and so when people say that i just i don't i don't even really do it anymore but i used to be like check out check out my trail cam pictures yeah now i'm like whatever man just keep believing that because i it's everywhere i mean we have we have pictures of deer just below the pa line on a lease in maryland that i hunt last year the year before and right now like trophy class whitetails yeah and uh, but we've managed for a long time but even that area is heavily pressured and they're still getting that big you know if you if, if you're okay with like if the, if everybody was like i know it's overpopulated with people here but if we all just i guarantee you if you gave you gave it two years off you went into the woods around you'd be like oh my god like, yeah i mean you got to have a consensus is. on that and the thing is because because of the population being and, and the amount of hunters in PA that we have, you can let that, you know, one year, year and a half old deer walk, but there's a good chance somebody else is not going to do that. Yeah. For, uh, around Hylersburg, I've even seen like spikes dead in gutters and stuff where, where I, where I do hunt there sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, Cause there's some real swampy spots. You can find some good deer back in there. You're really, really close to where, where I I grew up. I mean, this is this is the our neighborhood, really, basically. Right. So Heilsburg's not not far at all. This uh this buck right here, Brady took last year and rifle. And uh I'll let you why don't you tell him tell him a little bit about that adventure. Yeah, so uh, no just to rewind here and retract I think what you guys said here is on on point. Like I just never knew if there was just a lot of farmland and just nutrition uh, from here to where we hunt in western Pennsylvania. But the mountain deer, they just seem bigger. I just like, oh, they get more exercise hiking up and down the mountain. Farm deer get big. But uh, no, it all makes sense. But uh, it just seems like bigger deer up there. But no, this guy here, uh, I just tied in the good karma. Our, our grandfather, you know, your dad, he just has a hard time getting around, getting old, as we all are. But uh, I was just going to stay in, make sure he got to the stand a little bit. Uh, we're seeing some good deer in archery, you know, some out of range and just good stuff on trail cameras. But um, 
just kind of my morning I essentially kind of took off. Pat wasn't feeling well. I get to my stand. I see four other guys in orange. I'm like, what's the point of being out here? But you just never know. Rifle, the deer change up their patterns. You you just have to be in your stand, and you just got to wait. If it's uh, it's, your, it's your turn, it's your turn. If not, you know, it's right safe, place, safe, right for, safe for another day. And, you know, I think 10 o'clock hits. I'm like kind of cold. I'm like, screw this. I'm tired of seeing these guys. I'm going to at least go and check on Pat, maybe get something to eat and move. And I uh, relocate. I get up to my spot on the peak of the mountain. And honestly, it wasn't too much longer. I probably got to have checked in with you around 11. It was probably around 1 o'clock. But uh, I just kind of hung out for a little bit. And there was this buck and a little six-point that came along with it. And uh, we talk about the cameras. And uh, Was it I, the only one that messed up with the film? I had that? my uh, camera on. Um, I guess where I was sitting, because I was sitting on the ground, I didn't wasn't in stand. I guess uh, my my tactic cam button got pressed, and I lined up the shot. I turned it on. I basically turned it off. You see, like a split second of it. But I was I was scared. So in archery, there was a, a nice buck, probably similar, and I shoulder shot it, got away, arrow penetrated about this much, broke off, no blood, just hair. I was really discouraged because I'm like, man, biggest buck I ever got. Like, I'm staying in my stand. I call a few people, like, just to calm down, like, let my emotions out. I was fired up, and and we go look for blood, and nothing. Air was broken off. I could have cried. But uh, so this one here, I, it was kind of facing me quartered and shot. Like, uh, you hate to see where we hunt on the backside of the mountain. It went down the wrong side. It didn't go where we wanted towards the meat pole. It went straight down. So, uh I waited a little bit. I, you know, I think I reached out to you like, hey, you were you were relatively close by. And like, hey, you know, we got some tracking to do. And I'm just looking for blood. I can see some gut remnants. And the, just the blood wasn't that great. And we got on like a slight trail. And it just tapered off like nothing. And I'm just kind of like looking at him, not the saying anything. The blood was anything. bad. It, like I said, are you sure? You sure you shot that deer? You know, after what had happened, you know, in, in archery season, he's I'm positive I shot. So, you know, I just, I didn't give up. I just kept on, you know, yeah. going, descending down into the valley, knowing I had to, like, get back, you know, drag it back up. And we, we picked up blood. Yeah, we picked it back up, and it started to, to pick up, and, you know, we eventually found him. So it was, like, huge relief when I saw that white belly. Can't describe it, but um, especially after the season I had. But uh, I think just where we hit it, I, mean, I think I hit it on the right side, and it was going down the hill that it just pulled up on the inside. Mm-hmm. And when I did yep. uh, field yeah. dress it, it was just filled to the brim with blood. But that's my story. Uh, at our camp, we have uh, a tradition. We have a small wall and a, and a big wall. So any bucks that are killed up there, um, they need to be hung up there unless you mount it. So if, unless you pour the money into it. So we're starting to build up a collection, but I'm, I'm pumped to uh, hang this up on the, the big wall and get my name up there. Yeah, it's like it's it's kind of difficult to get on the big wall up there because there's that criteria that we don't all agree. We're, with. we're the younger guys, you know. I'm not mm-hmm. the youngest anymore, but I'm still considered in the young guy group to for a few more years, hopefully, you know. But uh, the old timers, you know, they got their bucks that are on the wall, and uh, they don't want anybody else to have any bragging rights, you know. So you got to shoot a nice. That's a nice. That's a nice buck. I don't know what we. I think it's a the unofficial one sixty. Yeah, the unofficial official score is one sixteen, but we didn't we didn't bother with any deductions. Yeah, I, I would I would say uh, that's what I would get. This this looks very typical. What's what's funny is Appalachian deer. All in my opinion, except for like two or three big deer I've seen, they all look like this. They're you get a lot of big typical eights that are like a perfect curl eight. Or a ten or a nine. Right. Like a lot of the deer our camps have shot don't have any. It's not they don't have character, but this is their character, yeah. and it's the dark, the dark rack. And I and Dad and I have talked about this before. I I think it's because they live in in dense white pine and cedar thickets on the the dark side of the mountain mm-hmm. a lot. The older these bucks get, they're living by themselves. They're deep a lot of times. When right. You know. In the rut during rival season, they're moving more, but most of the year these bucks are in shaded areas and and they're they're hiding. And I, and the mountain allows them the sun to never touch these racks. I 
it's so it's so typical of a mountain deer, in, in my opinion. Mm. And we're hunting in Augusta County, Virginia, which is four hour, four and a half hours from here where our camp is. So, you know, that just goes to show, like, all of I have a deer on a plaque uh, right in my studio that looks just like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's funny. It's just, and I have another rack sitting there of a small eight point that was a two and a half year old I shot last year on the backside of the mountain in the rut, and um, he was cruising through a saddle. I shot him, but yeah, no, it look, looks just like that. Literally, like perfect curl. He's not like crazy wide, but he's like real symmetrical. So, so many, yes, yeah, symmetrical. So many of those deer have those attributes in the mountain, which is cool. I love that. I would say maybe two years ago, you shot a six point, but the left the left side left hook, yeah. You know, we called it the left hook buck, but like the left side was completely broken off, and it was still a six. And I mean, it would have been a dandy if he had both sides. Yeah. And then that was two years ago, and then last year, his dad shot an almost identical, identical deer with the left side broken off. And you know the the beautiful symmetrical yeah, rack on the right hand side, and so like, it's like it's just weird um, to see two years in a row, same antler broken off. You know it's not the same deer, but right. um, it, it the happened. Battle. But they're not small deer, and you yeah. know something kicked its tail. I, what's funny too to me is I spent all my child because I've hunted there since I was three or four. Like I've I've spent all my childhood deer hunting down there, and the locals. The locals killed some nice deer, but they would they would say, "Well, there are no big deer in the mountain." Like and even our, the older guys at our camp, but they would walk like a quarter mile from camp, and they had we have they names <laughs> for every spot on that mountain because they've been since 1952. They have like names for every single ridge, every dog leg, every saddle, like right, whatever, and so. They would be like, "Oh yeah, I'm going out to Wild Bill's tree stand or whatever." And, that, <laughs> and you knew where he was headed. And it was a, it's a quarter mile from camp. You turn, you go down a real flat ridge, and you just drop right off the edge. It's like very easy walking. So my dad and I, when I was when I was a kid, dad caught wind of another guy hunts with us, an older guy who kept going way away from camp and going way down on the steep side of the mountain, the backside. And we were like, every day he'd come back. I saw a three point today and a five point. I saw a six point today and an eight point and the eight point ran right past me. I just never got my gun up. And he's, it's not that he's a bad shot, but back then he was. And, <laughs> and he would, he would, he got, he missed like two deer in two days. And finally dad was like, let's go. We're going. We followed him out, walked to the next ridge, dropped down in dad shot a buck that morning, like at 9am. The, Next, I think like three days later, we did it again. Dad shot another one. I shot one. And then it just snowballed. And we started hunting off the backside of the mountain, two miles from camp, make a left, down the mountain. On the Great down. It doesn't get light down there until 11. It's not light until 11 in those saddles. And in the rut. Know that feeling. In Yeah, it's cold. And the wind's hitting you in the face coming up the mountain in the morning when the thermals are rising. You got it. But what's cool is in the morning, as soon as the sun does peak, the thermals all shift up. So when we're hunting these saddles, midday bucks would be cruising. And I've seen some hellacious bucks down in there. And uh, we've gotten some nice ones and some bears and stuff. And it's just one, it's like as soon as we got away from camp, we realized the size these deer can get. And so I took a trail cam two years, a, a cell cam two years ago, out about three miles from camp mm -hmm. to a spot. In an old clear cut where there's always the mountain gets real low and the logging roads come up right next to the top of the mountain and then it peaks back up and the deer hop over there all the time. And so there's always huge community scrapes through that area. I put out a cell cam and every night I got buck activity and I got two bucks that were like four plus years old. And we were like, and in the middle of the night, we're like, oh my, like. We know they're out there, so but it's, it's so hard about. to find them. You know what I mean? Because that mountain's just so vast. It's like, you, you don't know. You just <laughs> a lot of it is right place, right time. Mm -hmm. You know, like you've got to be at the right spot. And um, it's a blast. I mean, that's that's the thrill of the, the chase, yeah. though. You know, that's why we do it. So, sweet, man. Well, yeah, I mean, 
appreciate you coming out. I know we were sort of just been rolling here and rapid fire, but um, uh, so you do the Mountain and Marsh podcast. You started that. How long you been running that? Um, I think it's three years now. Okay. Um, and like I said, we used to do weekly. Then we switched to bi-weekly. And then I, I had to take this summer off with the recording and stuff. And social media has been slow. Um, but it it was it was something that I just thought that you know we could do, and um, it would be fun. And it was, you know, it, it is. We we've, we've had so much fun doing it. And um, you know, I had talked to you. And you brought it up earlier about if you want to make money or if you just want to have fun. Right. Because when we got into this, say, five years ago, the entire thing, we realized very quickly that either we were going to sell our soul to the devil or, you know, and our families were going to go to ruin or we were going to just do this for fun. Yeah. Because we we were we were like, all right, what can we do? What are we going to do? With, are we going to do trade shows? Are we going to bounce around? We'll do local trade shows first. And. All that stuff is fun, but it all costs money at the end of the day. And Big investors' and, time, and, and time, and and the thing that I've learned now at this point is all the investments that I put in were for fun and for the experience, which is which is great. Mm-hmm. But looking back, I'm glad I didn't try to leap into something else be, just because it it would have been such a toll on my wife. It have been because awesome. I, I was busy then with construction anyway. So I'd imagine it would have just been, you know, I I have some buddies who have spent months on the road at trade shows away from their families because they have a product that, that that they're great products, but you got to get it out there somehow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And and that's it. You have to, you got to sell it and go, you got to go. Like you can't sit on the couch and spend time with the kids and expect to also. So it's a, it's a game. You really got to play the game and, um, I'm just glad I did it the way the way I did it because I you know I enjoy having being around my kids a lot and having them out in the outdoors. I would rather just stay away from the trade shows and sure. Know. They're fun to visit once in a while, you know, but to go and like set up and 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 be a vendor at, you know, mm-hmm. you're you're putting a lot of time in, a lot of travel, that sort of thing. And you know, I'd say for us it's hard to get guys on the schedule because our schedules aren't Busy even itself, synced, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, like I said, I said earlier, like if, we, if I can get three episodes recorded and published in a month, I'm happy as I can be with that because, you know, we do want to guard that time with family and, um, you know, yeah. you know, my family and your family and just, uh, you, and you're young yet. You got a lot of, yeah, like you got energy to do stuff. Um, you know, me, I'm pretty much, uh, I got my rhythm and my routine that I get into, you know, with my, my wife and I, but, um, trying to lock, like lock in on schedules is probably the hardest thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. so questions for, for Mike. No, I think, uh, it's good to kind of sit here and get to know him and his journey through his podcast. Like he's been doing a lot longer than us from what we hear. Yep. Uh, I think just personally for us, like, uh, you highlight on as uh, before we really started to turn the cameras on and the, the mics is, you know, just how much we, uh, we learn and we reflect as we, uh, you know, grow and continue to put content out of, you know, Hey, we were like this. And I think it's been nice after each episode, we kind of reflect and we're like, Hey, how, what'd you think of that? And how do you think the flow of conversation went? So um, just to highlight on, cause you, you primarily just run it solo or you got a guy you run it with. No, uh, it's it's solo, um, and the reason was it was scheduling. We we yeah. could ha- because guests. I need to cater to guests yep. scheduling, either either in person or over the phone. Um, because I have to cater to that, it's hard to also have one other a co-host, another person who's going to be there. And at the beginning, we did do that, and it was a lot of fun. Um, we had another podcast we did also where it was called Take a Joke and we where we just <laughs> you know whatever we were just hanging out like whatever BS and but it's it went from all this that we were doing and multiple people to after probably a year it just turned it was just me because I just I got fed up it was almost like too much stress trying to deal with multiple people's schedules at least I could deal with sure. one. And because I do a lot of call-ins with people from all over, 
like if I talk to somebody from Canada or I talk to somebody from Texas or California, the time zones aren't even the same. So they're still at work when I'm home and could record. Yep. So my wife will attest, like there were nights that I'd come in the house at 1030 because we didn't get on until 9, 915. Me and the guy from California who had just got done eating dinner at six and was, you know, yep. just now sitting down on the couch to talk. And uh, and it was great because we, we did some really good stuff and, and I learned a lot and other people had to learn a lot. But at the end of the day, it, that is the to me that is the most stressful part. Spending the money, it is what it is up front, and it's an investment, you know, right? But the uh, the amount of time that I've spent stressing over are those people going to call in? I haven't heard from them, or are these people going to show up? Or the text I get at five when we're supposed to record in person at six? Hey, uh, not going to make it work got crazy. It's like, I understand work gets crazy, but also it, then I'm like, that's why I shot you a message this afternoon. I was like, man, I haven't, I haven't sent anything. We haven't exchanged any like contact in a few days. And, uh, last thing I got from, from Mike was, Hey man, it's on my calendar, which like I said, that's speaking my language, Yeah. but I'm like, man, I, I probably ought to like send a, Hey man, I'm looking forward to it or something just to get a warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Because that, I mean, you do pretty good. Because um, you know, we certainly checked your your podcast out when we got started, and and um, found out you were lo- another local guy, and yeah. um, you do pretty good. You got some pretty pretty interesting guests that have come on the show, and you know, um, we're we're figuring that out. You know, one of the things that we've actually did because we're only like I guess in June or July we're probably hit a year, and. Um, you know, something I did at the end of the year last year, not not a full year into it, but I did a uh, like a year in review at the end of the year. And I just did like a whole show with sound bites. And it, it is fun to go back and look in the rear view mirror and see all the people yeah. that have come on, the stories that have been told and that sort of stuff. But um, you get some pretty good guests on your show. Yeah. I, so one of the one of the coolest things is when I started this show, I because it was so long ago. Some of the guests that I have had when they were just a small time group or a person right. trying to make it in kind of like the outdoor social media arena and or in the industry with a new product. Some of those people that I've had when they first started have become friends, but have also gotten big. So like Alex Cummins, for instance, is a, a buddy of mine from Alberta and Alex when I met him, Alex was doing a little bit of waterfowl guiding in Alberta. He's a heck of a goose hunter and duck hunter. Um, and that was it, though. That was what he was doing. He's a truck driver by trade. And what happens is up there, it gets so cold and nasty that they got to park the trucks at some point anyway. So right. he was spending the winter times and throughout the late fall guiding for geese and ducks and just slaughtering. So I'm like, I got to, I followed him for a, like a year and I'm like, I got to reach out. We became buddies. Now I think he still trucks a little bit in like a, in like the summer months, like two, three months, mm-hmm. but he is a, he's a guide for muskox in the Northern territories in Canada where there's no cell service. They live in big Cabela's tents covered in furs and, yeah. It's like negative 20 every day. He and like Lee and Tiffany Lakoski have gone up there and uh, Vicky Kirilenko and her husband, they they were up there, I think, last year. And just all kind of people that like they just killed a world record muskox there under his guiding. And so it's a he and, and he still does waterfowl. And now he owns his own spring bear guide service in go. Alberta. So this guy is guiding like nine months out of the year, and he just does the trucking now as like a little boost. Yeah, where he used to do waterfowl guiding as a boost. So he and he goes to these huge events. His daughter shot like the biggest youth buck in Alberta two years ago, I believe. So he was at. He goes to all these events. He knows all these people, and so now when I if I have him on the podcast, he's he's a busier guy now. Obviously, with when I have him on the podcast now, it's like. I get to reach out to him, ask him, "Hey, you want to do a podcast?" And he's always he's super cool. He's always like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah let's let's schedule something." But also, he's a lot bigger than I am. He's a lot sure, bigger than yeah. he, than he was when, when we started you, talking. Yeah. And and so you know, um, I got a a guy, uh, Rye Ludwig, who I went 
to school with um, most of my years in school. Rye and I grew up together. Rye works for Midwest Whitetails. He films. He lives in Iowa now. He films uh, for Midwest Whitetails. He's killed some bucks on camera for Midwest Whitetails. His wife killed a buck last year uh, on camera for them. Other guys in our area are a part of their Eastern Division. They hunt in Maryland, and they've killed some gnarly bucks in Maryland uh, for Midwest Whitetails and stuff. So I I do know some people, too. I get to, I get to do some cool podcasts that way. And, but, yeah, I, I, I just reach out to people. It, it's kind of weird at first. I'm not a shy person, but I'm not like an outgoing person. I I would much rather not talk to somebody just in case they're an ass than talk to somebody, if that makes any sense. Yeah. We're, we're like like that because I, I I say, you know, when I'm around a large group of people or whatever, I'm kind of just, I'm watching the room. Me too. You know, I'm evaluating the room. I don't need to be the center of attention. But, you know, if you talk to my wife or anybody that knows me or even Brady, he's like, you put him on a microphone, he'll sit and he'll talk. Doesn't you know? take much to get that flip. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, when, whenever I, you know, when I connect with people, I'll sit and I'll, I'll talk and, you know, share stories and that sort of stuff. But, uh, yeah, I can relate to that for sure. Yeah. I think that, um, like, when I first started reaching out to people, I was really weary about it. And, and you do run into people who will leave you on red or, or will answer you and be like, I don't have time for this. Like, some people are arrogant. They got egos, but that's true. every industry. It doesn't. It's true. It's I painful. meet plenty of people who suck. Like I, you know, yeah. through my business, it it just isn't what it is. <laughs> but I will reach out. Let's say that I scroll through Instagram, and I'll be like, you know what? This person, this person, this person. They all do different things. I would love to talk to this guy about duck hunting in New York. I'd love to talk to this guy about hunting in Arizona for deer, whatever. And then I. I'll just reach out to them and I'll ask, or if I have something in my head, like, man, I'd really like to learn more about snakehead fishing or whatever. I'll just right. reach out to two, three, four guys. And maybe only, actually this has happened to me. Like only one of them will actually commit, but I'll get a great podcast out of it. So I kind of learned to not care as much. I was like, whatever. Like if, if they don't like me or they don't want to take the time, that's their, it's their time. It's their prerogative. I'm not going to like bug them about it. But when I do get them, sometimes you'll be surprised at the people who would be like, just cool with it. Like they, Jason Lebo reached out to me, who's the right. guy who's like so huge on social media. And he, I think he lives in York Springs. So he's another local guy, yeah. Yeah, but he he Keystones and Ketones guy. He's he does a lot of hunting, uh, makes all the funny videos that are on Facebook and TikTok and all this stuff. And like actually, he reached out to me. I can't even remember how it worked. But uh, he does some sick of hunting down the shore. I duck hunt down there a lot, and we connected, and, and we talked a lot about that. Um, so it's sometimes it just happens that way. Once, once you get uh, big enough, I'm not big, but, like, once you get big enough, well, you network. I've seen your yeah, name. You've been or, around long enough, too. Yeah. As soon as, once that happens, it's like. It's kind of it's kind of simple. It's like reach out to people if they don't like it, whatever. Yeah, yeah that's the like. way it is in business and marketing. You know, in general, you know, mm -hmm. I and mean, you know, as a business owner, you know, you go out, you got to get your name out there, and uh, you want to get your brand recognition and that sort of thing. But um, you know, we do a lot of you know in the business that I do, I do a lot of uh, marketing where I'll go out to mixers and marketing meetings, and mm -hmm. you know, just you're just trying to get your name out there, but you'll meet people that you connect with on something, you know, and w when we are like reaching out, like the people that we've reached out to, like you said, you like, I just see somebody, whether they comment on a YouTube video or we start like, you know, going back and forth, you get a little dialogue or maybe they are just into something that we're into. And, uh, we just reached out to, uh, you know, Brady's got the, the dog here, Cincy, and she's, he's trying to get her like trained up. She's still young. He wants to train her how to track. And so we thought, let's get a let's get an episode. Bring on somebody that knows something more about it than what. Because I've never There's raised a dog to do that. that. There's, There's a ton of this. people out there that that know more than you do on a, a subject matter. Mm -hmm. And um, like you said, Mike, there's. You'd be surprised at how eager people are to share their knowledge mm -hmm. with you um, on a subject matter that they're passionate about. If you you just got to connect with them on on something like that. I think that anybody who doesn't is is kind of just selfish like why why wouldn't you want other people i i don't understand it but you know it's like our business sale race solutions there's 
it was a brand new concept. I went to a bunch of events um, and like these communities for realtors and we were connecting with all these people. Mm -hmm. And I actually have multiple copycats now. I, I know. And they won't say anything to me, but I see through social media what they're doing. And I'm like, oh, so they're doing yeah, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. We, what I explained in front of an entire group of 100 people um, because people were interested. Now there's copycats. It doesn't bother me that there are. That should be flattery, you know? Yeah, you know, yeah that's what I told my wife was like, that's kind of weird. I'm like, you know what, though? Like, how cool is it to know that the idea worked? It was an idea that I came up with drinking a beer in my garage. So sure. The fact that the fact that there's best best ideas like from some there. of the best this, ideas. This you know? is a this yeah. is a great and I'm, now I'm like it, it, it's real. Like my idea was real. It, was, <laughs> it came from here and now there's people like copying me. So that's kind of cool, you know. I don't I don't see especially in the outdoor industry, the people that I've talked to that have been ignorant to me I, ignorant doesn't mean ignorant, right? but mm -hmm. the, the people who have been right you know, mean, mean, mean to me or in any way, or in my opinion, it's like, you know what, then I don't need to talk to you. It, like, if you're like that, you got something wrong with you, man. Cause the outdoor industry, 95% of the people who focus any time in social media, in media in general, in videography, the community could be tight knit and but there's you know there's these people there are some people who are are mean you know they'll be mean to us to me it's like you know what man like we're all just out here having fun you know it, we're, we're not all michael Watt. you know michael yeah. Waddell, michael Waddell was a great bow shot don't get me wrong he's a good camera he just man got, to start he just got pulled in the real tree and all of a sudden he's michael Waddell. it's like yeah if you talk to him at an event he is the coolest dude. my uncle got to hunt with terry and mark drury and said they were like the coolest people that he was out in Missouri hunting a farm next to their farm. And one of the guys that were with him threw a live raccoon off the side of the road into the truck with him. Like they're just, they're just like normal people. Like, right. Well, that's the thing. You know. Like it's that common thread being cut from the same cloth, you know, and that's yeah. where we all connect. I think, um, you know, if you love the outdoors and, and, that's where we all come together and have this common thing. And for, for me, and I would say 95% of the guys that love the outdoors, we want to pass the tradition on. We don't want to see it be a dying right. sport, you know? So why wouldn't you pass along what knowledge you got or skill set you have? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. so anyway, I think that that's a, that's a common thread that most of us have, but you're always going to find one of those. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. always somebody. It's It's in everything, but like I bring up real estate. Yeah, like fifty percent of realtors, they just suck. They're not good people. Like their their e their egos are bigger than this table. Like yeah, and, and it's not. Some of them don't even make that much money. They they just think because oh, I don't even have to work. It's I just push a pencil yeah. and I'm I show up in my Mercedes that is on lease and I sell a house and it's like yeah man like I'm out here sweating and I'm dirty but you know what this is this is clean money like I don't to, to don't me it's like no, no, nobody has to be that I was still no, no yeah. nobody's got to be that way at all and and in the outdoor industry that's why it really bugs me because it's like I understand the money aspect if, if it's like, money to be made your ego but in the outdoor industry the percentage of people who make it in that in the money realm mm -hmm. That's a different thing, man. Like my buddy Rye spent eight years of his life filming, getting into getting into filming, filming, then getting in with Midwest Whitetails East, filming in Maryland, paying for leases, killing some big deer in Howard, Montgomery County, then turning around and getting the opportunity to go film in Iowa, but he had to move his entire family and like his life yeah, to Iowa. Yeah, cost. He ma he made all those decisions and all those costs. There's people who have had a podcast for six months who won't answer you. It's like, hey man, just because like you're sponsored <laughs> by Beaver Game Calls or something, yeah, like, yeah. you're sponsored by some random like I don't care if you're a pro staffer, man. Like you know why I'm not a pro staffer? Because I don't care. Like I'm just having right. fun. Like it, right. we I had some sponsors that were on the show, like and they were like, hey man, could I? And I don't charge them like nothing. I charge them like five dollars a month. Like yeah. I, it was like, yeah, man. I'll, as long as you help me with some of my fees, I'll say something about it. Like I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It's like whatever. Well, that's what it comes down to. Like we're having fun, you know. And if you're having fun, you know, at the end of the day, like I say, you know, we we just want to keep the lights on. 
and uh, keep the bills paid. But, um, you know, because there is a little bit of an investment to doing this. But, yeah, I mean, you find somebody that has a like-minded, uh, you know, passion. And, yeah. you, you know, people people will support you. Like, I know once we get, like, some guests on the show, they think it's pretty cool. Like, you know, and I reach out. You know, we started out with, like, people we know. And because it's a common passion and people that I grew up with, we've all gone different directions, but we all have that common thread of, you know, outdoors, hunting, loving, fishing, you know, camping, whatever it might be. And uh, you tell them you're doing a podcast, you tell them, hey, you know, would you come on and be a guest? You know, some guys have like really embraced that and, and we appreciate it, too. And we'll, we'll have them back on because, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about community. Like we yeah. we start our shows and under shows usually saying like hey it's, we're addressing our hunting family so like everybody that's listening you're part of the hunting family like Mike we don't know each other personally but we've connected through you know social media right common right. Uh, uh, points of interest and stuff and uh, you're part of the hunting family and it's just the way that it is mm-hmm. yeah and you know what else is funny too is there's if you go on Facebook there are so many people who. Uh, Completely crap on other people, and mm, that's it's plenty of that. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty <laughs> big thread. Like that, that's it happens a lot. Um, and and to me, I I try not to pay attention to social media very much because to me it gives me the heebie-jeebies. I'm like, you guys aren't real. Like, like yeah, yeah. Why would you say that to other people? Like that's that's not you know you wouldn't do that. But also, it, there are so many people who will battle it. Like, so, okay, I. Only hunt with a vertical bow. I thought about buying a, a long bow, but I've been or a recurve. But like, I love compound bow hunting. I love duck hunting, but I diver duck hunt most of the time. Um, I hunt hard. Like we, you know, we manage a lot, and I know a lot of people who don't. And and like Chris and I are very good friends. And Chris would shoot a spike all day long, like mm-hmm. to me, and I wouldn't. It's right. not that. It doesn't make me mad that he doesn't like it. Isn't like he's hunting on hunt, my lease or whatever. Hunt, yeah, yeah. Like it doesn't. It doesn't bother me any. I might give him crap for it. Like we might go back. That's and what you do with buddies. Him. But like I, it's not. That's why doing podcasts with those guys is fun because I don't. I don't feel bad at all for like. <laughs> crap but you know, we we just kind of we go back and forth a little bit. But it's it's all in good fun. But there's so many people who are like. If you're not in a lone wolf tree stand shooting a long bow at five yard, like there's yeah, so many people, or, or yeah, yeah, like you're not you're not hardcore enough. Or in in the waterfowl industry, it's it, and social media, it's heavily focused on how many pile pictures you can post with twenty ducks, you know, ten ten geese, five ducks, whatever. I have as many days with full straps as I have shooting two ruddy ducks. And I spent all morning in 15 degree weather. My face feels like it's going to fall off. Uh-huh. And I've been in white caps all morning. That is, it happens. I'm not going to act like it doesn't. So when, when like, okay, so like Chris and those guys, they don't really hunt. I hunt off a kayak a lot. Like I, I don't want to be in a blind. I want to be like laying in rocks with my face covered up with a blanket until the ducks are right in my face. Like I don't care like this. I am like you get into it. Yeah. So so for, for me, that's, it's just another thing. It's like with Chris, they, they like, you know, eating ho-hos and sitting in a blind and me, me, I'm like, (laughs) I'm just taking this can of Copenhagen. I'll be here for 12 hours. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like that's how I, but at the same time, I don't care. It doesn't like, cool. Like do your thing, man. Like it, whatever. We're, we're still buddies is, you know, we all, we all get along great. There's too many people who hate on other people. Well, that's just because it. Because of like, what they do, and it's like... Can we celebrate one another in the hunting community? Because, look, when it comes down to family, like in our family, if we like you, we're going to give you a hard time. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's... kind of low. If you fit in, like, somebody's going to give you a hard time. And, um, you know, so that's the way that it is in, in the hunting family. You said about, like, piles of ducks. I'm looking for a picture. Because I don't do a lot of duck hunting. But I got some sweet photos that I'll uh, share with you from uh, the little bit of duck hunting that I've done. I just got to locate it. I've seen some pretty setups uh, that have, like, the bunker, and then they got the McGriggles are making, like, breakfast for you. Oh, those guys are hardcore, the, yeah. The warmth of that. So, I, like, I 
they personally have not duck hunted. Chris is trying to get us out. So, like, if if he got a nice breakfast set up for me, I, I think I'd rather go with Chris than you in the canoe or the kayak. Oh, no. <laughs> no, last year, last year we shot two mallards one day on the Monoxia River, probably three miles into a float, and it was bitter cold. It was snowing so hard that the ducks landed right in front of us, um, and an eagle jumped them. We shot them, but like I. I love that. That's to, and and I'm not old enough that it bothers me yet. But I there's just like last year I shot that buck at five yards, literally from here to that whatever that workout thing is. I like he stepped. He was so close that when I was laying down with my bow beside me, he he pushed the doe right around here, and I saw his rack go past me over a log, and I sat up and drew back and shot him. But like that's what I love. I I just I just bought a full decoy we're going to use decoys this year i rattle a lot we hunt off the ground a lot like that's you know that's just how i like to do it so the first time i went duck hunting i was invited to go duck hunting for a you know a work event and i was like man that's during that's during hunting season mm. you know so i had to like sacrifice for the for the business for the company i sacrificed took one for the team and uh, I went down to yeah. Stuttgart, or Arkansas. Yeah. What is sacrifice going to do? I had no idea. World. I had no idea. And, you know, and we're just going out, you know, and, uh, you know, every day was like that. You know, oh, yeah. the pictures like that. Every day yeah. was, you know, you go out, you get up in the morning, you hunt for like three hours, two hours, three hours. Oh, Everybody's limited out. You come back, you eat a big breakfast. And, you know, like it wasn't really hunting. No, that's that. Well, so personally, I've never been to Stuttgart. One of my best friends, who I diver duck hunt with a lot, he does. He goes every year, and uh, he'll he'll There's text me in the morning while we're laying. Yeah, yeah. While, that's while, what it's about, right there. While we're laying in a layout yeah, boat, yes, you know, rocking back and forth, we're laying in a layout boat, and he's like, "Yeah, just shot two pintails." <laughs> I'm like. <laughs> and I and I'm out here like Ugh, yeah. like yeah. the ducks aren't working today. But I might go down to the flats on the Susquehanna Flats and see thirty thousand ducks in the morning. Like that is that's what gets me pumped up. I love whitetail hunting with a bow. I love going to Virginia. That's rifle. But I you know I love going to Virginia. And um, the cool thing about Virginia too is when we're on public land, we don't we're not managing. Because everybody there is out just right, to sure. shoot something because yeah. you might not see anything. So, you know, we – and Dad and I, my cousin Justin, like, we, we got some spots. See, if you want to go, like, see something, I we'll go. But out there, it's like a 10-day a period of release. I go out with the 7 mag, and if something walks by and it has, it has an inch of antler – it's dead. Like I'm just yeah. like, let's go. Like that's, but that's my release for the year. And then I get back home, shoot some does at home, and fill the freezer. And then I'm right back in it to normally I'm right back into duck hunting. And that's it. I duck hunt for two months straight. We don't every day of the week that I don't, I'm not working. I'm duck hunting every Saturday. Um, and then Sundays we're deer hunting. So, so Mike, I got a twofold question for you here. It sounds like you answered the one. So I know you're big into archery hunting, as you said, for deer. And then also the duck. So number one, you know, if you had to pick one, which would you pick? And then number two, as a guy that never duck hunted before, what's my sales pitch to get me out of uh, my tree stand to to hit the venture and to to hit a hit a honey hole with uh, with with your buddy Chris or you know with one of my buddies to try something new? So we um, we talked about this before on the podcast. I think Chris brought this up before. I would archery hunt deer. Before I would duck hunt again, if I if I had to pick one, but the the main reason is meat, just because you know I'm filling the freezer with the deer, but also I got, since I was I shot my first deer at nine, and since I was five or four, maybe three, my dad bow hunted off the ground a ton, and that's where I I love it. I, I have a saddle, I I got all kind of stuff, and. For me, it, it's like addictive. Like I've watched my dad off the ground at ten yards shoot a deer. It's like at this big. So for me, it's I just love it. I, I love everything about bow hunting, especially the rut. But what I've done is, and here's kind of part of the second question, the pitch. 
what I've done is I have set my life up to where I do not deer hunt. If I have like a really good deer on camera, dad and I, dad and I will go in and try to kill a velvet buck in Maryland. But other than that, as soon as early October duck hits for two weeks, two weekends, I'm wood duck hunting. I'm wood duck hunting any days in the, in the middle I can get, and I'm wood duck hunting that weekend. Then we have early muzzleloader. I don't muzzleloader hunt for it, I bow. And I'm kind of, I'm timid on my spots because the rut hasn't really kicked in yet. I might hunt a scrape or something. And then as soon as the rut kicks, I'm full bore with a bow. Then it's rifle season. We're going to Virginia. Then we come back, it's Maryland. So I'm spending, when it's not waterfowl season, I'm spending my favorite times in the woods anyway to deer hunt. It's early in September, velvet deer, or it's late mid to late October. October 31st is my favorite day of the year. It's mid to late October. Rut kicks in, and then I'm full bore rut bow hunting until rifle. There's a secondary rut during rifle in Virginia, and then I'm back in Maryland, and we're catching the back end of the rut there. And then as soon as duck season rolls back in, I'm the late season. I, there, is a, there is a split that's in the rut, and I hunted it one year, and I said I would never would, and I missed a weekend of bow hunting to go do it. We went to the Eastern Waterfowl Festival, and I hunted Assateague. It was 60 degrees in Assateague, and the wind was blowing 40 miles per hour off the ocean. It was terrible. And I said I'll never do this again, and I will not. It wasn't enjoyable. Yeah. So, so I, I like it cold. So when I got back, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm not doing that again. And it's just that I base my time frames on what's really in season that I enjoy the most now. So it helps that when it's late muzzleloader, my dad loves late muzzleloader. And I do too. I like, I, it's a great time to shoot some does as well. But our winters have gotten more mild. Over like the last five years, especially in Maryland where we hunt, the winters have gotten more mild. And so even though it's better with a harsh winter for ducks, when it's mild, the ducks will shift down from up north and stay in the bay and just bounce around. So I'm hunting birds that are still there instead of sitting in a tree stand with a muzzle loader freezing or the bow before season, like yeah. freezing. Yeah. I just, I bypass all that. And I, I've given up. I've kind of like picked the best times for each. You figured a rhythm and, out. And I, and that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's my, that's my pitch is you don't have to give up the best times of the year and don't do not. If you like whitetail hunting as much as I do, don't give up the, the best times of year to whitetail hunt, it would be like going coyote hunting in the first week of turkey season because your buddy was like, hey, let's go coyote. It's like, no, nah, man, it's turkey season. Hold on. Yeah. So it, it's just that's – that's and I love turkey hunting too. And that's just how I kind of base all, my, all the rhythm. And that's a good way to do it if you want to – even if you just want to pick like one weekend to do it and schedule it, throw it on the calendar, just get it out ahead of you and be like, you know what? I'm just going to try it this weekend. I'm not going to muzzle it around. And then all of a sudden, I promise you two years from now, you'll be blockading time off um, to, to go waterfowl. Awesome. As so we talked, yeah, get it on the calendar, step <laughs> yeah. one. If you don't get on the calendar, it's not going to happen. But uh, I'm interested in your take here, too. So you're prioritizing the rut, it sounds like. Um, me, myself, I had a lot of school, seven years uh, to become a physical therapist. That's what I do for my career. Uh, so taking time off through school sports from high school through college, um, taking time off, there really wasn't there. I was busy. I was, you know, occupied with the books or I had something planned and it was on the back burner. But recently, uh, two years ago, I really got hooked on hunting the rut. So, you know, it started off as taking, you know, Friday off and now I take off uh, Thursday, Friday. And now it's take off the whole week. It keeps growing each year. Yeah. I got plenty of PTO. Yeah. I, w- I would take off that month you brought up earlier if I had uh, someone else that would gladly do it with me. But they burned it all up, uh, you know, taking care of the family. But that's besides the point. But um, this year I looked into uh, the moons and following the moon cycle. So you said October 31st, your favorite day of the year. And I think there's the hunter's moon, and I forget the moon is after that, but you want to you know, time it up in between. And I think the Halloween buck is typically if you're going to be hunting um, when the full moon's not around, so when it's going to, the deer are going to be moving. 
But uh, I'm just curious to your take. So we brought up about the weather changing. Mm-hmm. Whether you think Rut's going to be in that window or you think Rut's going to roll over into rifle. So I've learned this through the podcast. I've learned a lot of stuff through the podcast. And there's a couple things that are absolutely true based on scientific fact. My buddy who works at Midwest Whitetails would tell you completely otherwise. The guys at Midwest Whitetails believe that the moon plays a, plays a role, and they believe that weather plays a role in the rut. Does within a 48-hour period, I believe. Or on a cycle. Or on a cycle. They come yeah. in every... So, I when we moved into our house in Gettysburg, I learned this. I was putting out trail cameras. I shot a real nice buck with my bow. The first year we lived there. And um, I was like, I can't, we had so many big bucks around. I was like, I can't believe. And uh, I started putting out trail cams. After I shot that buck, I was, I was done for the year. And November 3rd through November 6th, every year, I, I would get the same bucks. Mm. But when they would die off, I'd lose them. So I, there were time frames through November 3rd, November 6th. There were different bucks, but they were always the, at the same. No matter the weather, no matter, no matter the moon, no matter the year, it was always the same. And so what I realized was I only have, there's a lot of does in the area, but I only have like three nanny does. And I have one there who has a Roman nose who's lived there for probably as long as we've lived there. She's old and gray. Every year, the buck, the buck I shot last year was satelliting the bigger buck on November third, November fourth, and on November fifth, I shot that that ten point. That doe comes into heat every year at the same time, and her yearlings run right with her because there's no hunters right there. It's it's right. battlefield, it's hallowed ground. They run her across the street on our property. She's there a lot. And every year I would get these trail cam picks. So I wouldn't base what if if you if you want to lean into say moon phase or whatever, that's fine. But I would not base weather. Now, if if it's say it's 31 degrees on November 5th, it's gonna be kicking in the morning. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. It's not the deer weren't out at night. It's that they've just been moving because it's so bitter cold. That that same thing would apply if it was 54 degrees that day. If it's 54 degrees by 9 a.m., you you still could catch a cruising buck, but it's not the does aren't moving as much, and naturally the deer aren't moving as much because it's not as cold. But that doesn't mean that whatever does in that area isn't in heat because absolutely when they come into heat, they come into heat. Um, and QDMA did all the studies on this. The moon phase isn't a thing. The um and and the weather isn't a thing to the rut. The weather is is a thing when it's late de- or well, mid December and it's late multi activity and it's five degrees out. Absolutely, those big bucks, especially mature bucks, are going to hang out longer in the morning into the daylight, trying to pack on the pounds, trying to pack in the protein and the fiber before they go lay down. So it all does affect. But when it comes to the rut. I wouldn't. All bets are off. And I, I wouldn't be worried. I would pick whatever time that you feel uh, is the best, and then for the next like three years, put trail cameras over community scrapes. Watch those trail cameras for three years straight. You don't have to be a crazy person and document with a pencil every time, every day, every. But I put all of my trail cam pictures of two plus year old bucks, like eights and up. I put all, I save all of them on my camera and I watch them grow. And on community scrapes is the best way in the rut to document them because you can, you can kind of, a lot of deer will be coming past large community scrapes in the middle of the night, but at least you know that they're there. And at least you know when they're moving in the nighttime and deer feed three or four times a day. So the reason that Sometimes when it's bitter or cold, deer will be out like at 7 a.m. in a field feeding. And sometimes when it's like 45 degrees, they'll be out there at 
8.30 a.m. feeding. It's just because the cold didn't take it out of them when they were they were in their bedding zone, and they didn't have to go out. They, their stomach wasn't hurting that bad. They didn't have to go out. and So it, it all that does play a role, um, but in, in the rut, it doesn't. And I, I'm... I'm partial to October 30th through November 5th. Some people have killed more big bucks November. And, and I'm talking like big, big bucks. I'm not talking like a spike. If you want to go shoot a spike yeah. like, at any time, you could, you know what I mean? But I, I, we've spent so many years. I've probably spent 12 years managing pro- two different properties um, and, and trail cam recordings and everything else. Just, just pick the days that you want to, you want to pick it. It, it's like one of those things, the crapshoot, you take off now, and then it rains four out of the yeah, five days you were going to hunt. If it you rains, that buck might be underneath of a log 300 yards away. You just don't know. It, it, you know it's one of those things. Yeah, so twofold, uh, you brought up that nanny dough you've been tracking. So I thought it's been pretty cool. Uh, I don't know. I'd say consistently the past five years, maybe a hair or two years longer than that, but um we have black face, you know, common doe. We've seen very identifiable traits, and she's got a big old black face. You she's know, uh, she's right been around now. Yeah. You know, you know it's her, and you, she's she's reproducing. Yeah, so she's been around. We see fawns, and you know, first there was uh, kind of a little loop by one of our tree stands, and you see the fawns like racing around, it's like awesome to see. You think, oh, I just picked up a bug, and then you see these two fawns racing. So. Pretty neat, but pretty cool to know that this deer has matured over the years and continues to reproduce. Um, another point is uh, in self research. I don't know, maybe you uh, you've heard about this too. I think it was up uh, northern Pennsylvania. That's where they did some research on the moon cycle, and I think they collared like three thousand deer. And this is where they were like trying to track their activity to hone in on it. But um, what some people were saying in dispute because the research was basically saying the the moon phase doesn't matter. It's not a thing. It's you know. It's probably it's, QDMAs because they're the probably. ones who did the the most recent like big study on all that. Okay, but yeah, a lot of people are just kind of coming out and saying, well, like yeah, they're kind of like farm now. You know, they put a collar around them. They're going to change their behavior, and you're just now, looking into one herd. I don't so know. I no, but, I don't know, but I just yeah. thought it was an interesting point. It's like um, like through research articles. The very end, there's, you're supposed to disclose like any uh, anything that would uh, harm the the sake of the article and the, the research, and then you have the pharmaceutical company right there. <laughs> well, re- remember, we we all were supposed to get stuck with a needle, right? And yeah. After the, they they did three months don't of research, trust anything so, they yeah, tell you. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't. And look, if somebody tomorrow was like, "Here's a, here's a study that says otherwise," like I, I would be open to it. I know my buddy from the Midwest Whitetails, Rye. All of those guys, the blood moon. They believe on November like 14th, blood moon. They'll be like, "That's the day you're gonna kill a 180 inch buck out there." Second week in That's November, like I, I'm gonna hunt the first week in November as much as I can. Second week in November, because I want to say like the last several years, it just hasn't been getting as cold. You know, yeah, 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 you yeah. know what I mean. It's been warmer late later in the year. So, um, I used to be like a first week of November guy, but like over the last couple of years, it's like, man, I really should have taken off next week. You know, so mm-hmm. it's that second week of November is where I'm leaning toward, and um, you know, that's where I put like if I'm going to throw my cards on on the, on the table, that's when I'm going to go, um, regardless of moon phase. But I do try to like bounce it around. Uh, you know, all bets are off in the rut. You know, so yeah, yeah, I, and that's another thing too. I so there's different ways to attack, like the rut. There's different ways to attack it. There's there are plenty of people who take off, say like a, a nine day period, and they're just going to go from Saturday, Sunday, Monday. They're just going to yeah. get full bore, but they're going to sit in the same exact stand location at a pinch point, and th- and they end up harvesting a, a nice buck. That happens. I get bored. Like I, I am like a like in the mountains. If it like you had said, you got up at ten or what? In the mountains, I will literally. If I'm sitting there and it's like, I normally go till ten. If it's like ten, even if it's not cold, I'll be like, I'm gonna walk over that ridge. Like I don't know. I just oh, yeah. get it like in me. I'm like, I want to see if there's a scrape up there on that ridge. So like, I'll just go. And we all have walkie talkie. So at ten, eleven, twelve, we one, two, we all Check talk. In. And yeah, so like a lot of times I won't even turn mine on because I don't want to hear. If I hear a gunshot, I will, but otherwise I'm like, I don't need to hear it. But then every once in a while I'll turn around like, Dad, where you at? And like, oh, I'm still down in here. I'm like, all right, I'm going to swing around his clear cut and come up through his clear cut and push you deer. And that works. But like I get bored. So for me, it's hard 
to sit in the same tree stand, dust till dawn, and wait. But I've done it like three days straight before and seen some big deer. But I like to rattle. I like to I like to get aggressive because like when a deer is walking in bristled up like mad, I've snort wheezed deer in. I've, I in Virginia one time I snort wheezed on one side of the ridge when it was like an eight point. He ran a doe past me through a thicket. On the other side of the ridge, I snort wheezed, and when I the next thing I heard was the doe crashed right over right in front of me and the buck went right behind me. And I because he was behind me, I couldn't wheel around with a scope seven right, bag right. and try to but I mean just barreling because he, he was mad. Like he had turned her and ran right to me. <laughs> and just cause he was so like I that gets me pumped up. So that's what I wanna do. I wanna like but last year it was cold for the first year in Virginia for that late November. It was actually cold that week. And Saturday, I shot the buck moving at like 9 a.m. in a saddle, at the top of a saddle, and in the same exact spot on Monday, I was walking, because it, this spot's like known for bucks. It's right next to private land. We walk way back in, and then the guys on private land have food plots. So when the bucks start moving, we're like, we got to be like, here. They push them to you. Yeah, So so we'll yeah, because they'll get in and start moving around with four-wheelers, yep. and they'll push them. So we'll get down in there, and sure enough, there's an eight-point and a four-point running a doe, but they're so far down the ridge on the other end of the saddle that I can just hardly see them bouncing through. But it was cold that week. I I thought that there was more movement that week than in the past. When it's like 50 degrees down there, which has happened a lot to us recently, It you, guys would come back to camp and be like, yeah, I didn't see a deer all day. Like I sat in that one spot a mile from camp. I didn't see a deer. just laying down. And it, yeah, because they're just hanging out. Even though the the secondary rut's still kicking, all your nanny does by then have been bred. A lot of your one and a half, two and a half year old does have probably been bred. So it gets you have to find like the on farmland. It's easier. They all use the same bedding area. Here comes the one and a half year old with the buck behind it. Down in Virginia, it's like now we got to go find a one and a half year old doe that is hot. Yeah, and, and you know, so it's, you know. But the weather down there and that late, in my opinion, does it plays a part for yeah. sure. Yeah, this year learned a lesson. We had a segment, it was lessons learned and just reflecting on the past year. We always have lessons learned, right? You you go out, you yep. learn from your mistakes. Yep, but uh kind of similar to you, like uh I like being mobile. I like kind of switching up where I'm at, just changing the scenery. Sometimes it's the same day or sometimes it's the next day, like, hey, you know, I saw the deer. You know, it's probably 75 yards away. You know, I'm going to move a couple trees closer. And I, I move my trees, and I think there's four or five does that were coming in. So I'm like, all right, like I'm getting excited. And they probably got closest at about 50 yards. And I'm basically hunting the peak of the mountain, just just shy from it. And uh, I'm like, all right, they're not coming any closer. Like, I'm going to wait. They just kind of got to that point, just walked it out. Well, I'm... I don't know. It's, it's newer for me. You said about your rat lanterns. I, I think one time I took them out, didn't bring them out again. It was fun. <laughs> you know, you get bored, you rattle them, but I brought a grunt call out and never really used that. But the lesson learned was don't grunt at does. I grunted, they wheezed, they took off. But yeah. what was cool, the other side of the mountain, I heard brush crackling. Like, it's like I knew a deer was coming. Because most of the time when deer come, they like sneak up on you. They're real mm-hmm. quiet, real agile. But this thing, you know, crash through the brush then it's like doing a little trot and then it starts to walk i was like holy crap like here comes this nice deer but um that was the lesson learned but i think also it was kind of cool and to note that hey if during the rut which looking back i think it was the first or second november so in that time frame you like to hunt um it was pretty cool and it, it worked out you know it failed in one way, but it worked out in the other. My brother likes to give him a hard time because he's he hit the grunt, you know, and the dose, you know, they they beat feet. Reacted accordingly. But in reality, the grunt there was a buck on them, you know, and it and it brought that uh, it brought that buck in to, to shooting range for him. So and they probably thought, oh, he's right there, and they took off because yeah. they had been getting right, the grunt right. The so it's a lesson learned. But like, I mean, it's it's like stories like that. You come back to camp and say, hey, I tried this. This is what happened, you know. And then you got you know guys that have sort of walk this road a little bit longer, like, my, you know, or myself and your, your dad. And, um, you know, we sit and we talk through like, well, tr- this is what you should have done. Yeah. 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 One thing too, is it took me, I mean, I'm 32 now and I've been, I've been hunting 
with a bow, muzzleloader, rifle since I was 11, um, 12. It took me until I was probably 26, 27, and, and that much time and development and maturity and like to realize because we hunt mature deer to realize what mature deer do and it's so much different than like any other it's just it really like in the mountain in the rut you're playing a different game you're playing a numbers game you're playing a time game like most of the time but there was a kid that showed up last year and killed an eight and a nine on the back side of the mountain the two different days that he was at, like the guy was a killer yeah and he dad said he was like 20 <laughs> well i'm like some people just got it. Like, I don't know. It, it know. took me a whole lot longer. Sometimes you have a good year, too, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th- but some of these guys, man, like nowadays, especially, I love the hunting public. They're one of my favorite people to watch. Um, and that's mainly because the way that those guys hunt is they the get way that it. I enjoy hunting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like going after it. And um, to me, like, I've spot and stalked some deer. And, like, to me, that is so much fun that – I've learned so much from those guys. They they have been a, a big influence on the way that I hunt, the way my dad my dad watches them a lot, the way he hunts, the way that we think. Um, and one thing I like about those guys too is, so they used to work at Midwest Whitetails, and they get shunned by the guys from Midwest Whitetails because they gave up a life of mm-hmm. hunting farmland, big, mature, like five, six, seven-year-old, eight-year-old bucks. To to go chase whitetails on large tracts of public land with zero knowledge until they got there on a Saturday and they it takes two or three days and to they figure shoot it out. a three yeah. year old on Tuesday or Wednesday. Maybe they shoot two a three and a four year old throughout the whole week. Two guys do, and to me that it's it's impressive that someone puts so much time, effort, trail cam reconnaissance. Food plots, that's impressive to me, but it's more impressive to me that somebody can shoot a three and a half year old in four days, going, sometimes two days, going in completely blind at the start, driving their truck down the road, finding a deer trail, walking back, finding something. Checking it out and figuring it out. All of that to me is like, that, that's not just skill, that's drive. If, if you're, you know, if, if you're out in Iowa on your 350 acres of, completely managed property and your neighbor is also in the same boat and that neighbor is also in the same boat, it changes the game completely for you. Where, you know, my uncle hunted Missouri out there. He said like three and a half year olds would walk by and he would be like, Oh my God, Oh my God. Oh my God. And they're like, Oh yeah. That one with the fork on its horn. Yeah. Like, and let it, it go. Like, yeah. yeah. Like I, I think he shot a four and a half year old 10 that was like 140 inches and they were complaining that he shot that. Like it's one of those things where these guys are so honed in to only kill. And then I watch these guys on YouTube, like with a bow at three yards in the chest. Like I'm like, that is wild. Like these guys are crazy. <laughs> that's what that's what I like. I, I strive for that. Um, you know, with duck hunting, I'm the same way. I'm like, I would rather tough it out and do my own scouting and prep, do all my I DIY so much waterfowl stuff and my kayaks all decked out. Like oh, that's cool. I, I do all this because that's what I enjoy. I right. enjoy putting the time in and then beating it up. Like I just want to go after it. And there's other guys that want to sit in the blind. That's completely cool. That's not me. I, I'm I'm just like I want to be out on open water in Chesapeake Bay, or I want to be like on a kayak, freezing cold, you know. Whatever. I, I, that's just I, I like I like like getting after this. Yeah, you know, it's like do do whatever it takes to uh, make it happen, and that's where like like there is a delineation between like your your random what I would call your normal hunter. You're like just your Saturday. You know, go out. They don't yeah. take the time off. They don't put the time in scouting or whatever. You know, they show up just before daylight. You know. Show up to camp last minute. Show up to camp last minute. Look, I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that are like that, and God bless them because if they're having fun, like hunt your hunt the way that yeah. you want to do it, I'm I'm all good with that. And normally they're the ones that are walking in the mountain spooking the books that I yeah, want to shoot at. That anyway. is exactly right. You know, <laughs> like I'm getting up, 
at 4.30 in the morning, and I'm in my stand before daylight, and I'm sitting there, and I'm freezing, and, you know, my, my hands are cold till it's 8 a.m. in the morning, and the sun's not even up yet fully, um, and, and you know, there are guys that are going to sleep in until 9 and going to walk out and, and move deer because of that, but at the end of the day, the guy like yourself that's putting the time in, that has the passion, that's going the extra mile, like, you're going to have more opportunity. You're creating opportunities for yourself. And that's the difference. That's I, I don't like doing anything in life that I don't think that I'm controlling some aspect. Sure. You know, it's hunting in the mountain. Hunting in the mountain is very, it, it can be very luck derivative, especially if you're not a local who has been hunting and scouting. The, you, you can't drive like three minutes to get on the that logging road or that road and drive up to get to your logging road. Like I know guys down where we hunt that do that. And they know the mountain. They'll like. They'll tell you, like, yeah, at eight o'clock at night when I was visiting Aunt Sandy on that side of the mountain, uh, I, I've been seeing this buck that's crossing here. He's a ten point, whatever. These guys are on the mountain all the time. They know the mountain. For us, we're driving four and a half hours and we're going down there, and then we are attacking from point A. But you know, I can kind of go to like a saddle on the steep side of the mountain that takes me an hour and a half to get to that nobody else will go to. But I know that I probably have a 50% better chance of seeing a buck like, yeah, yeah, yeah. than they do in that when they walk right out where all the locals have been going and pushing all the deer out, they're probably not going to. So there are ways to make it better for yourself. It's just, you're, you know, like you guys said, it's not, I can guarantee I'm going to see something, I don't know what I'm going to see, but at least I can put myself in a position to see something where a lot of guys will complain. And I'm like, the lesson learned is create opportunities. For yeah. Yourself. I was going to say like, for me, uh, we have 20 acres where our cabin property is and like archery season that works out great. Like you can hunt 150 yards away from somebody. You're never going to know they're there, but you know, deer's going to come to you or it's going to come to me. Like we're right. not both going to see it and it's not, not going to make it to me or it's not going to make it to you. So that kind of really taught me a young age, like, well, why don't we do this? Well, the reason was people are getting old. You know, they don't want to move uh, as far, far away as they want to. You know, they got their spot. They're addicted to their spot. But I was like, well, like, you know, state game lands borders our property. Like, I'll, you know, my stand and climb up. And yeah, it's a little bit of work to, to get to where you want and bring your stuff up. But yeah, when you get there, you don't have to worry about being cold, number one. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, you're away from everybody. You kind of got your spot and you, you know, you're not interfering with anybody else's hunt and it's your hunt. And for me personally, I learned a lot, uh, two years ago in the spring, uh, just hunting turkey all day long is, uh, the late May right. season when, uh, you can hunt dust to dawn. I was like, well, like it's nice out. Like, why the heck can't I do this in deer season? So I started doing more all day sits rather than coming in for that bologna sandwich at like ten or eleven. Learn to and pack the sandwich. Yeah, pack two Sorry. or three, and even three. I don't know if it's enough for me this year. We're gonna pack more, but uh, just being in the woods more, seeing more deer, like it just goes hand in hand. Yeah. So it's just common sense, but um, just making those adjustments and you know, pack a lunch. We're gonna be out here. Pack yeah. a lunch. It's time to go to work. Where, when, when you guys go out there, are you guys in a position where you can – are you dragging deer? Like, are you using a four-wheeler or are you dragging deer? No, like, we're dragging deer, and it's no four-wheeler. It's not And fun. so, like, this is, this is a great um, topic for me because last year we killed three deer on opening day on the wrong side of the hill where – if they don't get hung up by a tree, you know, they can, they can die on the spot, but they're going to, um, oh, I, I, they're, they're just going to go, you know, I they're just going to gonna slide. Uh, rewind to like what you said about your duck season. Like I'll never do that again. There's plenty of times where we're like, well, we're never going to hunt this backside again, just because we know how much that drag sucks. So in November, I was like, I'm never doing this again. Like dragging this deer up. We each had a handful of antlers. We would grab a tree in front of us. Mm -hmm. We would, you know, three, four feet, hook the antlers in on a, on a tree and then oh, I, I rock this climb our, every year. Yeah. So um, I'm like, I'm never going to do this again because I'm not a, a, a specimen of phys physique I, anymore. I, I you love know? that. I'm assuming you, you've favorite. done your solo too, so we'll have to get into Yeah, I mean, I'm year. calling for help. Yeah. But, well, he, he, the truth is. Oh, no, we, I'm calling for help. Okay. All okay. Right. <laughs> so, a couple of like 300-yard solos, but yeah. no. The real story, Mike, here is uh, my deer – 
died within 50 yards of the rich. And I had him cleaned, and I just needed help to, like, drag him back to camp. His deer, like we said, we had to, like, really look for, for blood. Mm-hmm. And we found it, but it went all the way to the bottom. And so, like, it was really it a It was workout. probably 400 yards. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. So I'm in, no- in November, or might have been early December. I'm never doing this again. By January, season's over. We're sitting at a table like this in my in my basement, my the garage. Prince. And we're like, man, I can't wait to go back on the backside. Like, we're doing Euro Mountains. It wasn't that bad. And it wasn't that bad. I can't wait to go. Like, let's go back there and do some shed hunting, you know? Yeah. So, like, it's so – it's funny how, like, so quickly your, uh, you know, your frame of mind can, can yeah. shift. But um, anyway – you said about you, your question was, are we using four wheelers? Are we dragging them out? So we're dragging them out by hand, but I am, I'm convinced that I'm just going to start packing them out. Like instead of dragging mm-hmm. up over that hill, I'm just going to pack them out. I'm going to, cause we butcher our own deer. I'm just yeah. going to, I got the game bags. I don't have the pack. So like I need to invest in a good pack that I can like load it, load all the meat up, but I'm just going to start packing my deer out and I'm not going to, because going to that part of the, the forest, I mean, we scouted it out, and, and that's that's where the fruit is. Yeah, we, so we've never packed out, and the only reason, I've had game bags, and I have a fiber, carbon fiber frame pack, Everstock bag, that I wanted for that purpose. Um, my, my wife bought it for me one year. Right. And uh, that's what I wanted for Christmas. She kept bu- bugging me. I'm like, good, I'm going to pack gift. deer out. Like, that's what I'm going to do. Got the game bags, and my dad, to this day, is like, we're not packing them out. Like we, we have a huge skinning pole back at the camp, and I'm, he's like, we're hanging deer up. Like we're not. And I'm like, okay. Well, two years ago, my brother, I shot a buck at like eleven, on the backside of the mountain, about. So I'm walking out the top of the mountain, about a mile and a half, two probably two miles. Make a left, and I'm hundreds and hundreds of yards down into the, There's a huge saddle, in, and I shot this buck down in there. We, Dad and I met up at 12. He was in the ridge next to me, and we didn't get back to camp with both of those dudes. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I shot that buck at like 8, 30, 9 o'clock. He got to me at like 10. We didn't get back. 12 is we got back after midnight. Yeah, yeah, it's an event. We, it's an all day event. We had coyotes coming up the mountain around us and we we're dragging my brother's deer off out. Uh, he was like four ridges in toward camp from me. So we got my deer to the top, drug it out the mountain, met the top of his ridge, went down, got his, come back up. And, um, and it was like after midnight and everybody's complaining and not, everybody was hungry. But what we do is you'll, We'll get up on top and then call in the camp. Be like, we got two deer out here, backs out of the mountain. Like we need, we need some help. Reinforce. And we have a deer cart. Sodas. Mountain dudes. We have deer. a deer cart with like <laughs> yeah, yeah. big tires on it. And so they bring the deer cart out with a backpack in the middle of it, and it's completely full. And that is cold beer. And then we spent. They take it down, meet us, and we spend the rest of the time coming up. Hundred yards that time. Stop. <laughs> Lay there, like, yeah. you're dying. Oh, I tell start you. your legs are burning. Start again, and we. But I, I love it. And you get back, you eat a bowl of chili, and it's like the greatest thing you've ever eaten in your life. Yeah, it's, and, and I, I love it. I, I think that's the coolest stuff. One, one of the spots that I hunt, it, it's no, it's notoriously steep in a ravine. There's a ravine, right? And every time the deer topped, I shot the buck. I shot right over top this ridge, and as he was coming across. The eight point, I shot him behind the front shoulder. He barreled across down through here, and I'm like, oh, he's dying right here. Like, I looked up, I'm like, oh, it's not even that far of a, uh, of a, uh, a dr- pull up through here. And he flips, but it's so steep that when he flips off his feet, he's airborne for like 10 feet. Like, he's like, yeah. And when he hits, he just takes off down the ravine into the gutter, and I'm like, oh. So that, it more work. The, the, yeah, the the drag that sh- to the top that should have been an hour was like three and a half hours, you know. But that, that's I, – I love it. I, I think people who don't get to experience the mountains and don't know the mountains – I've taken buddies down there to camp, and they're like, dude, I'm never doing this again. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. they'd rather yes. walk from their truck 100 yards and sit in a tree stand. 
me, I'm like, to me, this is awesome. You get, you can explore, dude. You can go wherever you want. It's you can get all, lost it's real quick. It's all public land. Yeah. Go that way until your legs hurt and then stop and sit down. Like, I don't, I bet if you walk far enough, you'll find a buck rub that you've never seen that big. I swear. See, and you know, these guys, we would do it. And then these guys are like, I'm not coming back. I'm like, how? This is the greatest thing to me. Like, I, yeah. it's awesome. The thing is, you don't know what you don't know, you know? And so, like, you know, we bring friends, you know, we take friends hunting and stuff like that. And if they've never had that experience, like, they just, you don't know what you don't know, you know? So, like, uh, we try to bring people into the experience, um, you know, whether it's hunting, fishing, or what have you, you know? Listen, man, we could, like, we can keep going or, you know, we've been rolling here for a little bit i know it's a late night so like we're gonna have to wrap this thing pretty soon but uh like we can always make time to to reconnect but um check out the studio too yeah yeah we'll come to you next time or whatever but you know so uh why don't you just lay out like how people can find you on mountain and marsh us social medias instagram facebook um i do have a tiktok i don't really use it um (laughs) And obviously the podcast, uh, everything, Spotify, Apple, Google, whatever. It's iHeart. It's all of them. Um, and I will get back into doing some more here soon. Um, but like I said, I've just been so busy. But I, I you know, I, I do want to keep doing it. I enjoy doing it. Uh, I might even shift it to like a once a month show or something just to just yeah. to keep doing it to make sure that I'm not giving up Consistent. on it, you know. Um, but to, you know, to keep putting that. So I and my social medias will be more active through, obviously, through hunting season and all. But. Yeah, there's, I mean, a lot more content while we're active in, in the woods and stuff. Yeah. I'll just tell you, Mike, you've been uh, you've been a help to us. You know, you probably you just don't realize, but you know, getting started, reaching out to people that uh, you know, yeah. you come on good authority, and I'm like asking you questions about how to do stuff or whatever, and mm-hmm. I might take your advice or I might not, but. Um, appreciate it. You know, really, yeah, really yeah, do. No, no problem at all. If you have any questions, please reach out. I don't, I don't mind at all sharing my experiences. It does, you know, doesn't affect me any for you right. guys. Right. So it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Well, it's been good. Um, you know, I appreciate you coming out. I actually reached out to, to Mike because we were changing up our, our microphones and our system here. So this is actually an inaugural test here. So hopefully the audio sounds somewhat okay. Cause I don't, I don't got, I don't got earbuds in or anything like that. So we're going to, we're going to play with this, but um, you know, everybody else, you know, we appreciate you tuning in as always. Uh, you can find Mike at mountain and marsh and uh, you can find us at tracks and tackle everything we're doing. We're, uh, we're doing for the fun of it. And I'm sure we'll continue to connect through hunting season, yeah. swapping stories. Yeah, sure. and everything we'll we'll like link that. up some. And I, I know Chris has got a blind out of Cadoras this year. So That'll be cool. We're gonna get you guys out there on the blind instead of just sitting up, you know, yeah. on the edge. So, yeah, that that'll be sweet. You get, you guys should go out and experience it. It's fun. It's fun for sure. Yeah, loving it. Yeah, so check it out. All right, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate you hunting family. And uh, as we always end this uh, podcast, we're gonna just uh, remind you guys: get outside, do something, and uh, stay wild. <laughs>